Cool, thanks. All right, so um, welcome to all of our applicants that are here with us today. Hopefully your interviews went well, which I'm sure they did. Uh, so uh, I'm Rez Doherty. I'm one of the pediatric radiologists for our applicants. Hopefully everybody here knows me. Uh, today we're going to do um, mostly common with a couple of uncommon but uh, boards fair uh, fractures. So before we do that, let's talk about some basics about bones um, as they pertain to kids, because in pediatrics, um, you know, fractures tend to be very, very different than they are in adults. Um, and a lot of that has to do with bone physiology. So um, from an epidemiologic standpoint, um, boys are much, much more likely to suffer from a fracture than girls. And um, that's because boys do stupid things. And I have a seven-year-old and I can assure you he does stupid things on an hourly basis. Uh, their periosteum is a lot stronger than the bone is. So that's gonna be important. And that's going to result in incomplete fractures that we'll talk about in a little bit. And you have to remember that in real small children, let's say under 10, maybe, um, their ligaments are stronger than the bones too. And so it's very, very uncommon for a young child to have a quote unquote sprain or a ligamentous injury because the bone or the growth plate tends to give out before the ligament does and gets injured. So they tend to have fractures before they have um, ligamentous injuries. And then bones are stronger than the growth plate. So even the immature bone is stronger than the growth plate, which um, we'll talk about a little bit later. And so um, fractures like to find the path of least resistance. And so if they find their way to the growth plate, they tend to propagate through the growth plate. All right, so let's talk about some nomenclature. Hopefully everybody knows about the diaphysis, the metaphysis and the epiphysis, but we'll talk about the physis, which is the term for the growth plate. They're synonymous. Um, the physis, and then the apophysis. So what's the difference between an epiphysis and an apophysis as far as the physis um, or, the, uh, or the growth plate is concerned? And the answer is, um, from a histologic standpoint, nothing. They're 100% identical uh, chondrocytes that form them, but an apophysis is typically the insertion for a muscle group, whereas an epiphysis results in longitudinal growth of bone, right? So the stuff at the end we call epiphyses, they result in longitudinal growth. Other things like in this example, the greater trochanter or maybe the lesser trochanter or apophyses, they do not contribute to longitudinal growth of the long bone, but they do tend to be insertion sites for major muscle groups. I realize that I'm pointing to the wrong screen as usual. Okay, all right, so here's a physis, right? Because proximal humerus, here's our epiphysis, our physis, this contributes to longitudinal growth of the bone. Here's our calcaneal apophysis. This does not contribute to longitudinal growth of the bone, and it's the insertion site for the Achilles tendon. So epiphyses and physes all here through the digits contribute to longitudinal growth, and we already saw the greater trochanter and the lesser trochanter are apophyses. So that just helps with reporting and uh, with nomenclature and making sure that we're all sort of on the same page. One of the bones that gives people the most trouble um, who aren't used to looking at kids is the elbow, right? And in large part, that's because of all the um, ossification centers that we'll go through in a second. But when you look at an elbow x-ray, you really should be able to uh, look for two important lines. So there's the anterior humeral line, which is this line that comes right down along the anterior cortex of the humerus. And it should bisect somewhere along the capitellum, typically the middle third, you know, depending on rotation, maybe that's a little bit off, but it should certainly bisect through some part of the capitellum, ideally the middle third in a, in a real well-positioned x-ray. And then the radiocapitellar line, which is a line that goes through the radius, the radial head, and points at the capitellum. And it doesn't matter what view you're in, if you've got obliques, sometimes we'll do bilateral obliques, if you've got an AP, if you've got a lateral, you always want that radial head pointing at the capitellum. Radial head dislocations are very commonly missed because they're often associated with other fractures and we have satisfaction to search. Um, so always make sure that that radial head is pointing right at the capitellum. If it's missed, it can result in significant morbidity. And then we talk about fat pads. Um, I personally, and Donnelly supports this, 
don't believe in the anterior fat pad. I mean, it exists, but I don't look at it and I don't care about it. And sales signs don't really mean anything because I see anterior fat pads all the time in kids that are having x-rays for non-traumatic reasons. What really matters is this posterior fat pad. You should never, ever see a posterior fat pad. So what is the posterior fat pad and why does it happen? So think about our capitellum and our uh, trochlea, right? Our capitellum and our trochlea. Sitting back here in our distal humerus is this valley, this trochlear groove that our olecranon, when we extend our arm, is gonna come up and lock into so we can't varus and valgus strain the arm, right? So that groove, that trochlear groove has fat sitting within it. So when we do a lateral X-ray, that fat should be hidden down in that trochlear groove. But if we have an intraarticular effusion, whether it's a hemarthrosis from trauma usually, or whether it's an effusion because of juvenile idiopathic arthritis, or any of the other inflammatory arthropathies, or an infectious septic joint, that fluid is going to lift up the fat pad and we're gonna see that fat pad now come out from hiding in the trochlear groove on the lateral and we're gonna be able to see it. It is gonna elevate up your anterior fat pad. You may get a sale sign, but I find that to be really nonspecific and insensitive. So I tend to just ignore the anterior fat pad, really just focus on the posterior fat. Why is that important? Because if you see this and you don't see a fracture, I don't see a fracture here, you're just missing it. There's either a fracture that's there and you are missing it, or more often it's just an occult, usually supercondylar fracture that is non-displaced or because of the angle, we don't see it. Um, there's almost always a fracture if we've got a traumatic injury and this kind of joint effusion. Um, so you wanna just report that as joint effusion, no fracture seen, assume occult fracture and treat conservatively. All right, there's different mnemonics for the ossification centers. And so let's remember, this is the order in which the ossification centers appear, not the order in which they fuse. That sometimes folks get confused about that. The order in which they fuse is actually a relatively variable uh, and doesn't really matter. What matters is what order do they appear in so that you don't mistake a normal ossification center um, or an apophysis for a fracture and vice versa, and we'll see why that's really important in the medial, um, medial epicondyle fractures. All right, so um, some folks like Crito, I was trained with um, Come Read My Tale of Love, or a sort of naughty or not appropriate for public consumption version of it, but it stands for capitellum. So the capitellum appears first, and the agent appears doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, if you want to remember, in general, it's 2468 for boys, and uh, 3579 for girls, um, the age doesn't matter. Just the order in which they appear is really the most important. So capitellum should come first, then the radial head should come next, then the medial epicondyle, then the trochlea, then the olecranon, and finally the lateral condyle. Why is that important? Because if you see a lateral condyle ossification center and you don't see your medial epicondyle, something's wrong, you're missing it. That medial epicondyle is probably displaced into some space that you're not seeing it. So you wanna make sure that if something, um, that, they, that they appear in that order. All right, so let's move on to some actual fractures. So the first thing we're gonna do is the very, very peak specific incomplete fracture. So this includes buckle, green stick, and bowing fractures. Some people use the term torus fracture, which is um, synonymous. So most of them are from a foosh, and the most common location is the metaphysis. So in, on call at night, when you're looking at these x-rays, you really, really want to look closely at the metaphysis. And, and I'll show you some examples of, of what can be pretty subtle because you're not going to see a big fracture lucency through the bone like you see in adults. It can happen in any skeletally immature kid, although as they get older, sort of into pre-adolescence and adolescence, it becomes less common. And the wrist and distal forearm are really the most common location because of the push. So bones tend to bow rather than break. And that's because, as we said before, the periosteum is harder than the bone itself. So think about it as like a green sapling, right? If you had a green sapling that you tried to break in half, usually what's going to happen is one half of it's going to break and the, the bark, the periosteum on the other side is going to remain intact, right? as opposed to a dried, old, well-ossified piece of wood in an older patient where it just cracks right into half or you know, breaks into multiple fragments. So when there's compressive forces, we end up with a buckle fracture. Some people use torus fracture. 
And then when there's lateral forces, we end up with a green stick fracture. They're really both just considered incomplete fractures where the cortex um, is kept intact. And then occasionally when you've got hundreds or even thousands of micro fractures along the entire diaphysis, you end up with these bowing fractures where you don't actually see the fracture lucency, but the, bo the bone itself is bowed and gets treated as a, as a fracture. Uh, because we're talking about fuchsias and uh, incomplete fractures, which typically occur around the wrist, just real quick, the pronator fat pad can be your, your best friend. So here you can see it's relatively straight, maybe just a little gentle curve here. And then here you can see it's pushed way out and has this big rotation. That's because there's edema here. And so you're going to want to look real closely for a fracture. And then that, so that you might miss if you're not paying close attention. It actually goes all the way through to that side too. But if you see this pronator fat pad elevated, it's gonna be a good clue to look really closely. If you don't see a fracture, then really strongly consider that there might be a Salter Harris type fracture, which we'll get to in a second. And it's occult because the fracture is going right through the already loosened growth plate. All right, so buckle fractures here, right? Now you're never gonna see this in adults but you should be able to ski off of these metaphyses, right? You guys have heard me say that before. You come down off of these metaphyses, nice and smooth. You come off of this metaphysis, nice and smooth. Here you've got a little mogul, right? A little mogul. This gets missed all the time. That's a super, super subtle fracture that if you're not used to looking for it, you're gonna miss this 100% of the time. You can come down off this metaphysis and ski right off that smoothly. This one, you hit this little bump, all right? So that's a fraction. Gets missed all the time, but it won't bite you guys because you're ready for it, right? Same thing here, very subtle, but incomplete fraction. Green stick fractures, um, again, just another type of incomplete fracture. They often go along with a buccal fracture. So a green stick fracture is what we talked about where one side of the cortex, you do break through that bark, you do break through that periosteum, and then on the other side, you end up with a buccal fracture. Same thing here. You do go through here with this green stick and on the contralateral side, there's a little buccal fraction. And again, a green stick on this side, elevation of our pronator fat pad, a little green stick goes through here, doesn't go all the way through. And on the contralateral side, we've got our little mogul from a buccal fraction. And then finally, bowing fractures. So here we've got a complete fracture through our radius. And then you can see the ulna has taken on this sort of bowing. There's actually a little buckle fracture there too, but it's taken on this bowed appearance. Same thing here, you can see it's bowed. Here it's big time bowed associated with an, with an ulnar fracture. The radius is, it's got a bowing fracture, All right? So usually these, I don't know what happened to my thing, but uh, usually these are just splinted, occasionally casted um, for very, very short periods of time. And they typically don't require um, follow-up x-rays for, for healing monitoring. All right, so Salter-Harris fracture is another thing that is sort of by definition, a pediatrics only um, fracture. So you have to have an open growth plate. You have to be skeletal immature. And they account for about a fifth of all pediatric fractures and this was a, uh, either an in-training exam or an old, old written boards exam question of where is the most common Salter-Harris fracture um, in children? And the answer is the hands and the fingers are the most common. So real quick about the growth plate. Um, the growth plate is relatively thick, you know, and it's made of these hypertrophying chondrocytes, really large hypertrophying chondrocytes, the more proximal ones having more fluid around them. Um, and uh, being more likely to fracture. So even though you can't tell it on the X-ray uh, or even on MR, the fracture really tends to go through the proximal portion of the growth plate more so than the distal portion. Because as you get further and further along, you're gonna end up with the germinal zone and, and these tightly packed chondrocytes as opposed to these that have a lot of fluid around them. Uh, there's different mnemonics, there's different ways of memorizing it, um, but just, you know, figure out what works for you. Um, type one Salter-Harris fractures. So here's a metaphysis, growth plate's gonna be black here, and then the epiphysis. And so Salter-Harris one goes straight through just the growth plate. So if it's a non-displaced fracture, you're not gonna see anything on the X-ray, right? Because it's a fracture lucency through a lucent physis. So if you see a lot of soft tissue swelling around where an open physis is, just assume it to be a Salter-Harris one fracture. <clears throat> and they get treated like that.
<clears throat> a type two goes through our physis and then comes proximally through the metaphysis. A type three goes through our physis and goes distally through the epiphysis. A type four, in this case, they're showing it going straight across. Often it'll go through the epiphysis, travel along the physis, and then come out the metaphysis at another location. And then the type fives are the rarest in part because we miss them. Everybody misses them all the time because the hardest thing to see in radiology is the thing that's not there, right? And you don't know necessarily if that growth plate is just fusing normally or if it's gotten crushed. So that's where it helps to just know normal bone development in kids. Um, and you know, most people aren't gonna memorize every single one of them unless you're doing pediatrics. So they get missed a lot. All right, so we've got soft tissue swelling around here and maybe some subtle widening of the distal fibular physis laterally compared to here. So this we're gonna treat as an occult Salter Harris one fracture. Same thing here, we actually have a little bit of a buccal fracture here on the dorsal radius, uh, but you can see the dorsal physis of the distal radius is a little bit wider than proximally than, uh, than on the volar surface. And then here, distal tibia, we don't see a fracture lucency but we can see that the epiphysis is displaced in relation to the metaphysis. So now we've got a displaced Salter Harris 1 fracture. Salter Harris 2, most common type, most common to occur in the hand. And so here we've got proximal phalanx. You can see the fracture extends down to the physis, but not through the epiphysis. Same thing here in the wrist, fracture extends up to the physis, widening of the physis, but not through the epiphysis. And then this one here, it comes down to, and it looks like it approximates the growth plate. We don't definitely see it going through, but we just assume that that does go through because it's the path of least resistance. And, and even here, you can see that laterally, the distal tibial physis is a little bit wider. If you MR this, it 100% is going all the way through. So if that fracture lucency goes anywhere near the physis, we just assume it to be a Salter Harris fracture. Here's a three, goes through the epiphysis. Here's a three, goes through the epiphysis. Here's a three, goes through the epiphysis. And then a four, we took off a little corner of the metaphysis there, goes through the physis and, and has displaced this part of the epiphysis. And then same thing on that side, goes through the metaphysis, through the physis, and through the epiphysis. So Salter Harris four. And then here's a specific Salter Harris four type fracture that you may have heard of. This is the so called triplane fracture. So, if you ever hear a triplane fracture, by definition, it's a um, Salter Harris four fracture. And so, that is a sagittal fracture through the epiphysis, so the sagittal plane, an axial fracture through the physis, and then a coronally oriented fracture through the metaphysis. Um, this has implications as far as leg length discrepancies and um, premature osteoarthritis. So they often um, need a CT because ortho uses um, different measurements that we don't need to go into, um, but they use different measurements as to whether they're gonna take them to the operating room or not. A lot of it has to do with whether there's a step off associated with it or greater than two millimeters, et cetera. But just know that they often will do CT on those. And then finally, the type fives. Um, they, uh, they are a crush injury. So here you would just need to know the kid's age and know that um, this should not be um, so closely approximated, that this should not be so closely approximated that it should be wider open. You know, if I told you this was a 13 or 14 year old, this is totally normal. If I told you this was a three year old, then this is very abnormal. So you just kind of got to know the kid's age. Even then it's often missed. This is probably one of the rare occasions where it's worth getting um, contralateral views. The problem is it's almost always the distal tibia because of an axial loading injury, right? Like a fall and it's bilateral. So getting the contralateral view isn't really that helpful in most of these cases. So why do we have the classification system one through five? Well, one, it's just so that we can communicate, right? So we all know what we're talking about when we say Salter Harris two or Salter Harris four. And then the other thing is, as you go up in Salter Harris classification, you go up in risk for physeal arrest, right? So a Salter Harris one fracture, really, really rare to have physeal arrest, to growth plate arrest. Salter Harris five fracture, really, really high risk for physeal arrest. And then two, three, and four is somewhere in between those. 
if you have fysial arrest in your wrist and you're 11 or 12 years of age, it's not going to make a difference, right? If your arms are a couple of millimeters difference in length, you will probably never, ever notice that. But if you're more than two millimeters leg length discrepancy, then you will definitely notice that and you will definitely develop premature osteoarthritis. So it really depends on the location of the bone um, as well as the type of the fracture. So types one and two, they really just do usually close reduction and immobilization. Threes and fours, um, they may do open reduction and fixation depending again on where it is, particularly if it's a triplane fracture, if it's a lower extremity fracture where you're at risk for growth plate discrepancy or leg length discrepancy. And uh, the type fives, um, if it gets diagnosed, which it often doesn't until it's too late, uh, what they can do is they can do an interposition graft and they'll just put fat in there into where the growth plate um, ought to be to prevent it from prematurely fusing. We have till quarter after, I think, right? All right, supracondylar fractures. So this is by far and away the most common pediatric elbow fracture. So this is the one to know. We're gonna talk about a couple of other ones that are important, but this is the one to know. It tends to occur in sort of younger kids, so school-age children, and it's almost always an extension type. We're not gonna talk about the flexion type injury. And it's from this sort of nutcracker effect, right? So the olecranon, you extend the arm, the olecranon comes up, articulates into the trochlear groove, but then you hyperextend it and it keeps going and it fractures through the supracondylar region. You end up with this big hemarthrosis. Um, from an ortho standpoint, they worry a lot about neuro, neurologic and vascular injury. Um, I did once see them ask what, um, what artery is often injured in supracondylar fractures. And the answer is brachial artery. I guess from our standpoint, you know, maybe that's important for, you know, what would you vascular Doppler or something like that. Otherwise, it's a very clinical um, diagnosis. So uh, don't worry about the typing. It's really not that important. If you just describe it, that's really what needs to be done. If you want to remember, um, it can be helpful sometimes for the, ortho for the ER docs. A type one is an incomplete fracture. You can think of it as sort of like a green stick fracture through the distal um, humerus. So here we can see this subtle fracture here that maybe does, maybe doesn't go all the way through to the back. Here we can see it comes across and then stops here. It doesn't make its way all the way through. Here, it's just here, right? And then we've got a posterior fat pad that's warning us that we're missing something if we don't see this fracture lucency. So you don't want to mistake this for a nutrient channel or some kind of physis because you're seeing this now, right? So that's a type one. A type two goes all the way through. So here we can see the posterior cortex and the anterior cortex is involved. We've got our fat pad there to warn us not to miss anything. And then a type three is, hopefully nobody ever misses this, a type three is when there's displacement, right? So here we've got a big fat pad, here we've got a giant fat pad, and you can see that there's um, a significantly displaced supercomputer. Treatment doesn't matter, type ones just get casted, twos and threes depend on various things uh, that the orthopods need to worry about, not us. All right, lateral condyle fractures, they're relatively rare. Uh, but they're really important not to miss because they're easily missed and they can have significant implications. So we said they're relatively rare. They tend to occur in similar age group, maybe slightly older than the supercondylar fracture kids, but, but mostly school age kids still. And again, it's a foosh um, and we'll skip through some of this um, just so that for time's sake. So in this case, what you don't see is the issue, right? So here's just a, a, a um, an artistic rendering of the distal uh, humerus. And we can see our um, capitellum here. And so this is what we're gonna see on X-ray because our capitellum is just starting to form an ossification center. We don't have our trochlea yet. And we're just gonna see this little thin fracture lucency that comes down through the tip of the bone. Could easily be missed, could be mistaken for a, a physis, um, or you see it and it just looks like a tiny little thin sliver of a fracture that's no big deal. If we MR it though, and we can see all of the cartilage, we can see that it's actually this huge fracture that's coming through and extending down through the trochlear groove and separating the capitellum from the rest of the, of the distal humerus. And the uh, classification system doesn't matter. Even the orthopods don't care about this, um, but it's helpful sometimes for learning purposes. Um, 
but what you can see here is that the fracture has come through and has also interrupted the lateral collateral ligament. And this is why it's important to pick these fractures up because you now have a disarticulated joint, right? This humerus has no articulation with its distal fracture fragment and the rest of the joint. So that's a surgical urgency, if not emergency, depending on the degree of displacement. Don't worry about the type one, but here's some examples, right? So that doesn't look too bad. That looks like a pretty innocuous little fracture, but there's the potential for a disarticulated joint. There's a substantial amount of soft tissue swelling here that should hopefully clue you in that something's wrong, that this isn't just a normal physis. Same thing here. This is really innocuous. You could miss this, mistake that maybe for a physis or something, um, but you can see all this substantial soft tissue swelling. And so if you see this, a, you don't want to just call everything in the distal humerus a supracondylar fracture, right? You're going to look really silly in front of the orthopods. Um, and B, this is a potentially a significant fracture that that um, that may need surgical intervention depending on age and displacement and things like that. Here's another one. You can see how there's this radial head now has gotten displaced and the capitellum has been broken in half in addition to the lateral condyle. So we already talked about that. All right, medial epicondyle fractures. These are the rarest of the elbow fractures, and they typically do really well, even when they're really bad. Um, so, you know, you obviously shouldn't miss anything, but if you miss these, they're typically not the end of the world. Um, they can be either acute or chronic. So acute is either a direct blow to the epicondyle or occasionally um, a fall with an extended hand and extended hyperextended wrist, and you'll, the flexor muscles are all volse the, the medial epicondyle. The more common thing that we often see is chronic overuse, the so-called little leaguer's elbow. Um, and this is the equivalent of um, medial uh, collateral ligament tears in adults, right? Throwing off-speed pitches. So this is why you're not allowed to throw off-speed pitches in little league because you can end up with little league elbow. And this is really important to remember that if you do see a medial epicondyle fracture to look for that elbow dislocation because it's really common. So what happens? So here's another artistic rendition. Here's our medial bacondyl, here's our common flexor tendon, and either acutely or chronically, this gets pulled off. And when it gets pulled off, it gets drawn distally and often medially. And so it'll hide here in the joint. And this is where our crito or our come read my tale of love comes really important because you're gonna see all these other ossification centers present and your medial epicondyle is gonna be absent. All right, so let's look at some examples. Here's our medial epicondyle living all the way out here, right? If you somehow missed that or didn't see it or thought it was some kind of calcification in the soft tissues, we could do our come read my, we've got a little trochlea there. So if we've got a trochlea, we better have a medial epicondyle and there it is. And then same thing here, right? Our medial epicondyle is missing here and that's because it's gotten pulled into the joint. And we can again, go through our crito and see that we've got a lateral epicondyle, we better have a medial, but it's missing, it's gotten sucked into here. You don't wanna mistake this for either some kind of growth plate or part of the trochlea or an olecranon fracture. This is a displaced um, medial epicondyle fracture that's got pulled into the joint. Here's a case that we just had here um, in the last year, and you could very, very easily miss this. You could just think that there's some projection of the radius, some projection of the radius but our medial epicondyle is missing and we've got a lateral epicondyle here. And then finally, here's our medial epicondyle sitting way down here when it should be back here. And our radial head is not pointing at our capital, right? So there's a high incidence of radial head dislocation and elbow dislocation. All right, toddler's fracture. So toddler's fracture occurs in toddlers. And um, we don't really know why it happened. So this is really the one exception to the rule of a kid with a fracture with no history. So most toddlers fractures, there is no history. The family says, I don't know what happened. She or he just started limping. Any other time, oh, I don't know how he ended up with that femur fracture. I don't know how he ended up with those rib fractures. That's a big red flag for non-accidental trauma. For toddlers fractures, that's the one exception to the rule. There usually isn't a history of, of trauma. Class, there are other things that can, have been classified as toddler's fractures, but classically, and for any realistic purposes, when someone says toddler's fracture, they really mean a spiral fracture of the distal tibia. They can be very, very subtle, so it's really important to get orthogonal views. 
And if there's a really high suspicion and if it matters, which is debatable, you can get oblique views too if you think there's a toddler's fraction and you're just not seeing it. Because here, you know, this you could miss this if you weren't looking closely and you, you know, you weren't thinking about toddler's fracture. And you can see it here on the orthogonal view a lot better. Here, spiral fracture distal tibia, spiral fracture distal tibia. This and this are the exact same kit. If you get one view, it's no view, right? So you see absolutely nothing here. We get the lateral. There's an obvious spiral or oblique fracture, toddler's fracture. So if you have really concern, you know, if you're really concerned, they're really suspicious, you can do obliques, or you can follow them up in two weeks to see if there's evidence of healing. But the reality is, is these heal so fast that if you do it in two weeks, the kid's usually running around and acting fine anyway, and no one's going to do anything about it. All right, this is the juiciest stuff for the boards here. If they're, this will almost certainly be on, the, one of these things will almost certainly be on your boards. And these are the apophyseal avulsion fractures. They just love to ask you what, you know, muscular um, insertion site there is. So iliac crest, we can see there's an iliac crest avulsion here. This is supposed to be an arrow, and that's the abdominal obliques. Here we've got our anterior superior iliac spine. Don't mistake your anterior or inferior iliac spine for your anterior superior. For some reason, folks have trouble remembering which is which. But your anterior superior iliac spine, S for sartorius. Inferior, I know, you just got to remember rectus femoris. There's no easy to remember. But inferior is your rectus femoris. Your hamstrings, very common here along the ischial tuberosity. And then your lesser troch is going to be your iliopsoas. And I didn't put it in um, because it's relatively rare, but your greater trochanter is going to be your, um, your external rotators, right? Your gluteus muscles. So one of those will almost certainly be on the, on the boards. They really like um, anterior superior and anterior inferior iliac spine, but any of them are kind of fair game. And then um, this, I haven't seen on the boards, but it's been on a couple of in-training exams, a couple of the eponyms. So the Talo fracture, this is just a Salter Harris three fracture that happens in older kids. It's given this, this name with the Talo fracture. Um, it's really rare, but um, it's important because it's a Salter Harris fracture and it's, it's got a name. And you gotta remember that the distal tibia um, fuses from medial to lateral. So there's something called Kump's bump, this little bump here that's referred to as Kump's bump. And that's where physeal fusion begins. And then as a zipper, it goes out medially and then comes laterally. And so when this part of it is fused and you end up with a Salter Harris fracture, you get this very classic um, epiphyseal fracture, Salter Harris three fracture, and it's just termed a juvenile to low fracture. So if you ever hear that, you'd be 100% correct to just call this a Salter Harris three fracture because that's what it is, uh, but it's got a name. Montasia fracture is the one that often shows up on in-training exams. I guess it would be fair for the boards. It shows up on the pediatric, the general pediatric boards too, because it's just sort of so famous and, and people love it. But it's an ulnar fracture with a radial head dislocation, right? So you see an ulnar fracture here. Remember, no matter what view you're in, your radial head should always point at your capitellum. Um, I think people remember like mugger, Montasia, ulna, radius, I don't know. I go, just remember Montage is an ulnar fracture with a radial head dislocation. The eponym, the mnemonics are harder to remember sometimes. Uh, Galeazzi is going to be a radial shaft fracture with a drudge dislocation, so widening at the distal radial ulnar joint, lateral displacement of the, um, of the ulna, or medial displacement of the ulna. And then an Essex Lopresti, which um, I've only ever seen twice in real life, and I've never seen it on a boards. Um, but it's usually a radial neck or radial head dislocation with a drudge dislocation. And then um, finally, we're making pretty good time. Finally is the um, the chronic repetitive microfractures or the overuse syndromes. So these got to be like a hot topic probably about 10 years ago and they made their way into the boards and now they show up all the time on, on the boards, the overuse syndromes. So there's a couple that you're already really familiar with, right? So Syndig Larson Johansson, it's just chronic repetitive microtrauma at the proximal insertion of the patellar tendon, right? And you end up with this fragmented distal patellar pole. If I told you that this kid suddenly had acute pain and had developed symptoms, then you would just call this a patellar sleeve avulsion fracture, right? 
So it's really the chronicity of this what's going to matter. If they say the kids had pain for you know three weeks or three months, and then you're just going to call this Cindy Larson Johansson. If you know he suddenly jumped um, and had pain, then you're going to call this a patellar sleep. Osgood Schlatter is just the opposite end of the patellar um, tendon. You end up with sort of fragmentation. Sometimes you end up with this little rhino horn overgrowth. Sometimes this is fragmented. Um, and that's going to be Osgood Schlatter. You have to be careful because the tibial tubercle is often just a little bit fragmented and ratty appearing as it ossifies. So you got to make sure that A, they have symptoms. And often you can look and see a little bit of soft tissue swelling that's, that's around it as well. So this is Osgood Schlatter. Again, both of those are overuse injuries or chronic repetitive microtrauma. Um, other ones uh, that have sort of become hot topics as kids play three season sports and don't take time off between and becoming more and more competitive athletes. And as women get more involved in sports than say like in the 50s and 60s where it wasn't accepted and now where women's sports is, um, is accepted and, and popular, we're seeing more and more children just from a population standpoint with overuse injuries. So this is runner's knee. So you can see here, it's often symmetric in this case. Um, I don't remember if this was a boy or a girl, but in this case, this person, it was a little bit asymmetric. And you can see here, the distal femoral physis medially is widened. There's a little bit of subphyseal sclerosis on this side, compare that to this side. And so this is runner's knee. This is just a chronic repetitive Salter Harris one fracture um, that um, happens from overuse. Soccer players, long distance runners, uh, anyone that does a lot of running. This is gymnast wrist. So we see this, um, I would say maybe about half a dozen times a year in um, young boys and girls who are um, typically gymnasts. And you can see the physis is really wide in here, really irregular. We've got subphyseal sclerosis here, not as much in the distal ulna, but certainly in the radius. And this is just, again, chronic repetitive Salter Harris one fractures. Um, microfractures and fractures that result in gymnast wrist. And then not to be mistaken or confused with little leaguer's elbow, which is the chronic repetitive injury to the medial epicondyle, which we could have put in here as the overuse injuries. This is little leaguer's shoulder. And you can see we've got widening and irregularity, not quite as much subphyseal sclerosis. This is probably on the healing end of it, um, of the proximal humeral um, physis. And then the most famous, um, overuse injury, which you all learned in med school, is just the slip capital femoral epiphysis, right? So all the ones we talked about to up till now tend to be overuse injuries in athletes. This one is just an overuse injury, typically because um, the child's overweight or obesity. Um, it can happen in hypothyroidism and some other things that predispose you to it, but it almost always is obesity. And um, for this one, it's a little bit more obvious. You can see the ice cream is falling off of the cone. A uh, couple of learning uh, tips and tricks. We can draw Klein's line. So if we drew a line from the radial from the femoral neck upwards along that, it should go through part of the femoral head. If we did it here, we can see that it doesn't go through the femoral head. So sometimes it can be really, really subtle early slips. Um, the other thing is that when you slip, you slip medially and inferiorly. And so for early slips, you're going to see that on the frog leg lateral view. So if somebody comes in for hip pain and they're the right age, typically preteens and teens, um, you wanna make sure that they got a frog leg too and it's not just an AP pelvis because you're gonna miss the early slip. And um, there's a lot of morbidity associated with this because this kid needs to be immediately non-weight bearing, right? Because if they're continue to bear weight, they're gonna slip more. And we all remember that the proximal femoral epiphysis, the femoral head has a really tenuous blood supply, right? And so they're very prone to osteonecrosis, um, especially if it slips really badly. So I have, I did see an adult radiologist get his pants sued off because he missed, um, it wasn't that subtle. I mean, it shouldn't have been missed, but uh, it was, you know, it was a skiffy, um, probably along these lines that just got read as normal. And that's pretty perfect timing. So questions for fractures? Somebody just said this is ankle pain. It looks like this looks normal. Like when do you when do you raise the pulse if it's radiographically at all physically? So the ER docs, like this is really something that ER docs should be teaching each other. Um, 
but you're not always going to have a pediatric ER doc taking care of the patient, right? Like you might work uh, here. Sometimes they've got the adult docs taking care of kids, or you might go practice somewhere, not at a children's hospital and read pediatric x-rays. So it is worthwhile for us to know that, know about the treatment management. Um, a pediatric ER doc will train the residents and they themselves that if there's tenderness over a physis, it doesn't matter what the x-ray looks like. You treat them as a occult Salter Harris one fracture and you splint them. Um, but because you're going to potentially work at places where kids aren't getting taken care of by PGR docs, it's worth us knowing. And so it's not unreasonable to put in your report, uh, you know, soft tissue swelling around the physis, or even if you don't see that, just putting in there, if there's tenderness over an open physis, please consider the possibility of an occult Salter Harris one fracture. And again, you know, if you've got a five year old who's got ankle pain, right, and a normal x ray. They often get called a sprain, right? And we already said that kids that age do not sprain. You are going to fracture through the physis before you sprain, before you quote unquote sprain. You can have ligamentous tears in kids. We see it, but there's going to be fractures before that. So they're going to, it's going to be associated with substantial fractures. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys. And again, welcome to our candidates.